Happy Mother's Day to all the mums. Big clap for your mums. All the mums tuning in at home. Let's pray as we open the word this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we just want to thank you and praise you for all of the mums in the house today, all of them tuning in and maybe even watching this a little later on. We just ask your heavenly blessing on them, Lord. It's not an easy job, but it's a job that you've equipped them for, that you stand by them with, that you will never, ever leave them or forsake them in, Father. And we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just infuse a new energy in every mother listening, in the generations of mothers to come. In the powerful and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. How good is it to be here today? So good to be preaching with my family, my church family. This is new. This is fun. And um, so good to see you all. And what an honour it is to be preaching with Mother's Day. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, my name's Danny. I've been at Cadenia Church now for about six or seven years. Love it. Um, also run a charity called Brave Enough, which is part of our Cadenia World Changes. And I'm so privileged to be a part of that. Um, so Wow, what a great thing to support, hey, our projects locally and overseas, so amazing. Um, good to see some 96.3 people here today lending their support. You might want to have a chat to Simon G, who's sitting right over there about, yeah. Uh, Simon can connect with me in a lot of ways. We both do some things sometimes that are a little bit out of the box, right? Because we're talking mums today. And, you know, when you read the Bible and you have the, the picture of the ideal mother, I mean, who comes to mind? Isn't it Mary, mother of Jesus? You almost just say her name and you expect the clouds to part and Handel's Messiah to start playing with, you know, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know. That's not the kind of mum I am. I try my best. I aspire to that. I love reading, reading about the Proverbs 31 woman, but I'm more of a Francesca Battistelli or Jamie Grace kind of mum. Now, if you know any of those songs, there's lyrics like, my left brain is racing free, ADD's been chasing me all day. How would you just say? I'm that kind of distracted mum. Or the Francesca Battistelli side of mum, which is kind of the whole, um, you know, I've lost my keys in the great unknown and by the way, I, can you call me because I can't find my phone kind of stuff. Simon's good at that too. He rang his, his wife, Ree, looking for his phone in Harvey Norman. Ree, Ree, I can't find my phone. <laughs> it's in his hands talking to his wife. I can relate to Simon because I got the shopping out of the car one day and I had like my arms full, because I don't do things in halves, right? If I'm going to unload the car, I've got five shopping bags on each arm, and I'm like hoiking it in. Not to mention the fact that I had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and was pregnant with my third baby. So I got all those bags out, I'm hoiking them up. We've got this big, long bullnose veranda where we lived at the time. And I'm standing there, and I'm pressing the key, wondering why the front door's not opening. Then I start hearing some clicking to my right, and I look over and I see the car lights flashing and realise I'm trying to open the front door with the car keys. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy, crazy stuff. And, you know, it's one of those things too where, you know, as a Christian and as a mum, you kind of think, you know, my first default when I lose something or when something's going wrong is to pray, right? Well, this one day, I had Logan, he was about six, and we were getting ready for school. So the older two are, you know, getting ready, we're rushing around, doing the whole mum thing, can't find the hairbrush, can't find the whatever, and packing lunches and doing all that stuff. Mark's home too, he's helping. But do you think we can find Logan's school shoes? Nowhere. We turned everything upside down. We're rustling through toy boxes and looking in the car and nothing. Okay, well, maybe we're going to have to send him in sneakers and get him a uniform pass. Sneakers? Nowhere. Gum boots? Nowhere. I'm getting desperate at this point. Ugg boots? Nowhere. Flip flops? Nowhere. Nothing. So we didn't send him to school. We put Hannah and Adam on the bus, off they went, and he got a day off school because we couldn't find his shoes. And I'm like, what kind of mother am I? 
my kid has no shoes. And I'm like, we live a bit out of town, you know, to go get his shoes and everything. By the time we do that and then drive, you know, 30 minutes to the school, you know, it's no point. So later that day, I'm like, thought, you know, the kids are in bed, I'll get some work done. I go to sit at the computer desk and I feel something under my feet. I have a bit of a squiz. Every single pair of shoes that Logan owns are under the desk. And I'm mad. I mean, I'm hyper mad. I just want to go and just scream at him. But, you know, I did what all good parents do. And I'm like, on my knees, Jesus, take the wheel. And I won't sing anymore because that'll just clear the room. But, you know, don't we do that? We want to be that mum that goes to Jesus, take the wheel. Matthew West, forgiveness, all that stuff. And you know what? I stopped in that moment in reality and I just laughed my head off. And I thought, this kid is either going to end up being a really hyper successful businessman or he's going to be in jail. And we're just praying over him that he's going to be a great businessman or maybe even a preacher. He might, he might get into ministry with some thoughts like that. He'd be having some really awesome outreaches, wouldn't he, with some problem solving skills like those ones. Um, can anyone else relate? Any other mums here ever get unglued? Yeah? Come on, let's keep it real. That's the reality. And you know, I remember the first time I ever judged someone's mum. And when, it was when I was about four years old. I used to go to a, um, a little kindergarten thing at, uh, I think it was on Thompson's Road. I think it's a revival centre now. So you're probably talking circa, you know, 1980. Just showing my age a bit there. Um, but there was a friend that I had there called Kelly. And Kelly, um, Kelly liked clag. Kelly liked glue. And here's the thing about Kelly. Kelly liked not doing craft with glue. Kelly liked to sit there and suck the glue, suck the clag off the clag brush. And I thought, <laughs> whose mum lets them do that? She just loved it, loved the taste of it. And I remember judging her mum going, do you do that at home? Yeah, yeah, I do. I eat the glue. Glue, clag, um, not what it's made for. Interesting fact, though, did you know that the Hebrews used to make glue? What they would do is they would take the animal skins and they'd put them in a big pot of water and they'd boil it up. Um, particularly like ox skins. Now, I don't know if, if you've seen one of these cows before. It's a wee heathen coo, if it are Scottish, like my family is. It's not how you make porridge <laughs> with animal skins. And why would you want to? It's more like a teddy bear than a cow, isn't it? But that's what they used to do. And, and they boil these skins up, and as it broke down, there would be this sticky liquid that would just form on the top of the water and they called it strong water and they used to use it as a binding agent, as glue. And I'm hoping like heck that's not what was in Kelly's clay bottle. But what on earth does Mother's Day have to do with strong water or glue? Well, when we look at the ancient Hebrew word for mother in the original pictographic script, um, Aleph, is the first letter in the Hebrew. It's literally a picture of an ox. Now, if you can see on the screen there, you actually read Hebrew from right to left, not left to right, like English. What does it look like? Can you see the cow horns? Okay. Pretty cool. I wish English was like that sometimes. <laughs> it's a bit tricky, isn't it? It'd be good if it was just pictures. I suppose we do with emojis, really, don't we? So the meaning of that is strong because the ox to the Hebrews was strong. It was the animal that ploughed through the fields. Um, you know the saying, as strong as a ox. So the meaning would have been really, really clear to the ancient Hebrews when they were using that as a symbol for the word. Also, um, it means a position of leadership. It also means protection because the ox would lead the cows and the calves to safe pasture. And so when you see this symbol and you see the ox and you see that that's the first part of the Hebrew word for mother, it makes a lot of sense because mothers also need a lot of strength, right? 
Um, but what about the squiggly line? What do you think that might represent? It almost looks like a caterpillar with horns. <laughs> what do you see? It's like Mr. Squiggle, really, isn't it? We could maybe even make another picture out of it. It is actually water. So it's the waves of the water. And how powerful is that? Because with water, it's something that represents life and cleansing. And water is something that's essential to life. A mother is a giver of life. And you know, that's, that gets pretty deep because that's how God sees us as mothers, as strong water, as glue. But it goes even deeper with the water and I wanna spend a little time on that this morning because water is so essential to life, right? We need it to survive. So just keep this in the back of your mind, the thought of a mother when we're talking about this. 75% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. 70% of an adult human body is made up of water, which is why doctors always tell us to stay hydrated. 85% of the human brain contains water. Now think of it in a biblical context. Jesus himself is a source of what? Living water. Water is used for healing in the Bible. Remember Naaman, how many times was he dipped in the river? Seven times for his healing. You also think of the miracles in the pool of Bethsaida. Water also has the power to cleanse. We see that with um, Naaman and the leprosy. We also see it being deliverance that representation of deliverance, where Moses parted the waters of the Red Sea. God has significant meaning to the words and the names that he uses in the Bible. So it shouldn't surprise us that the word mother is something hugely significant. But it goes even deeper than that. Because when a mother is birthing, what is she bringing into the world? new life, right? But in order for a baby to be born into the world, it takes the strength of an ox. What's the baby covered in? It's protected in what? Water, in amniotic fluid. So in order for a baby to burst forth into new life, it has to go through that process and that water into a new world. It's the same as us with baptism, we die to self, and we rise again in a new life in Christ. Again, water. So a mother has to go through that process of, process of uh, strong water to even birth humanity. It's been that way since Eden. The Bible tells us about that in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 20. Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. So strong water could be all of those healing things and deliverance. It can also be chaotic or destructive as we see in the Bible with the storms on the water. And Eve's life became a bit of a storm, didn't it? When the fall happened, we're now living in, in that fallen world still to this day. And that largely became because of her choices. So strong water or glue is great unless we're stuck with the wrong glue. I had a friend who had some dentures and she was a speaker as well. And she was on a speaking engagement and her dentures actually snapped in half. So it's not a good look, right? So she's after some glue. She was staying with a pastor and his wife. Um, she was a crafter and everything, gave her some glue. So she patched up her um, teeth, got through a speaking engagement, uh, the glue was toxic. So she got on the plane to fly home, had to take her teeth out because it was physically making her ill. And when our glue in life, the things we try to hold our lives together with, is the wrong glue, when we're turning to the wrong things, it's toxic, it's poisonous. 
And the other part of it is becoming unglued when we need to be glued to God can also be dangerous, right? Hand up if you think you've parented your children absolutely perfectly. Okay, take a look around. Do you see any hands up? (laughs) You know, there's no way to be a perfect parent, but there is a thousand ways to be a good one. Um, No one's ever been impatient. No one's got no generational damage. You've made no mistakes. You've never questioned yourself or your parenting decisions if you're a perfect parent. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I need to swap out the chapstick for some glue stick. (laughs) It'd be kind of helpful, wouldn't it? But we struggle. You know, we worry. We worry about our kids, don't we? Do they know Jesus? Am I doing this enough? Have I damaged them when I've slipped up? Am I enough? Are our kids staying close enough to Jesus? And I tell you what, when they start leaving home and getting up into those upper teens, boy, oh boy, does your prayer life ramp up. It's a tough gig being a mum. You know, we're not all sitting around a campfire toasting marshmallows and singing Kumbaya. You know, it's not how it rolls. We'd love for it to all be the Kleenex commercial, wouldn't we? With the newborn baby and the beautiful smiles. And boy, there are those moments though, aren't there, as a mum? Do you remember the first time, mums, that you ever held your baby? Wasn't it special? It's precious. All that pain in an instant is gone. It's amazing. But the job is tough. God believes in us, though, because he calls us strong water. So he's not going to call us to something that he's not going to give us the strength to do. But the reality is, Kids, be good to your mama. She's got a lot going on. Okay, we've got such a diverse amount of mums around us. We've got working mums in this room right now. We've got single mums. We've got mums that are struggling in their marriage. We've got mums with physical or mental illness. We've got mums that are lonely. We've got mums that are anxious. We've got mums sitting here right now going, how am I going to pay that next bill? We've got mums looking after sick kids and sick spouses and parents. Some of us have never had an example of a mum and maybe, maybe you're in that category and you're floundering. And maybe, maybe you're just so busy trying to be the mum you wish you never had or you just don't know how to do it and you're doing the best you can but you don't seem to measure up to that perfect picture that a mum should be. You know, I think particularly on Mother's Day, it's, it's a day where some of us are grieving because we can't be mothers. Maybe we're working along, you know, a path of, of trying to have a baby. Maybe we're walking a path of infertility and we're grieving what we may never have. Some of us are grieving on Mother's Day Sorry. Because we can't celebrate with our grandmothers and our mums because they've passed away. Or maybe there's a broken relationship there that's not healed. Or maybe like me, you've lost a child and the day just every year feels that little bit tainted because you have a child or children missing. You know, Mother's Day can be a really tough day for so many reasons. Some people may have even chosen not to come to church today because it's just too hard. And you know what, if that's you and you're watching from home or you're watching this a little bit later, you know, we love you and we just want to bless you and and love you that little bit extra today. We just acknowledge that and, man, no judgment here at Cadena at all. And maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum. Maybe you're a wonderful mum, you're confident in your parenting, your kids love you and it's all you know, roses, well, thank you for that. Thank you for the blessing that you've had growing up in a, in a Christian home and, and knowing how to do that well because you are such an example um, to some of us mothers and me included that, that didn't have the privilege of growing up and knowing Jesus and are trying to, you know, work out my salvation with fear and trembling and by the grace go I um, as I'm bringing up my kids and having to unwind that stuff. But, you know, isn't that just 
the most motivating reason to break some generational damage and some chains? Isn't that a great reminder today on Mother's Day? And so I know this isn't probably the warm fuzzy message that you might have wanted to hear, but it's the real one that is. And you know what? We can't conquer what we will not confront, right? So sometimes we actually, as a family, we need to get messy and we need to do real. Because do you know who's in that place? Jesus. God is in that place with you. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The tabernacle of God, the Emmanuel, God with us and in us. And do you know what that means? That means there is nowhere you can go in the space of the time continuum, even if you had a DeLorean, that God is not with you. He's with you in life and death. He covers what's gone before and he's already where you're going. So the point I'm making here is that no matter what our own perceptions of ourselves are as a mother, no matter what we think other people or our kids or anyone else thinks of us, we're here in spirit together today, right? We've all got different backgrounds. We've all come from different spaces. We're all just being human. We're all just here being real. But here's the thing we have in common. We all need mother figures in our lives that have done some journey ahead of us. I actually have not seen this movie yet. It's been on my list for about two years. But I loved what it said based on the untold true story. Meet the women you don't know behind the mission you do. Helen Sank's a great movie. Okay, I'll have to watch it this afternoon. Maybe that can be my Mother's Day <laughs> treat. But the reality is that mothers are often hidden figures. I can guarantee your mum has a bunch of stuff that she's protected you from over the years. Sometimes that might have even been in the form of adoption and having to give you up to protect you. You may be in a broken home where you've got parents that are at odds. I guarantee there'll be stuff you don't know because your mum has protected you. You know, we had a, a bunch of baptisms recently in this church, amen? How good has that been to see our young people making decisions for Jesus? You know, it's so cool. And, you know, sorry to call you out, Campbell. I think it was you. Um, Campbell was giving his testimony and he got quite emotional and I actually was sitting there listening and getting quite emotional too, hearing him talk because he, he gave a real gift to me that day and he said, you know, I grew up in a Christian home but it wasn't flawless. But it was enough. Do you hear that, mums? Our kids are not expecting us to be flawless. They know things are not perfect. As they get older, as they have their own kids, they're going to see that stuff. For the mums that have got kids that have wandered away from the church, keep praying. We only do the best we can with what we've got, right? And God's got them. We commit them to God. He's got them. It's powerful. And there comes a point where as mothers and as fathers and as parents, you know, we have to give ourselves a bit of grace. We have to extend the same grace to ourselves sometimes. That can be harder to do than even with other people. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. But, you know, Jesus himself provided his own mother with a son and a friend um, when he was dying on the cross. And I know it's not Easter, and you've probably heard this story a zillion times in the last month or so, but I want to take you to the crucifixion because this is a place where heaven meets earth, where death meets life. And I want you to pay particular attention as I read through it. If you'd like to follow along on your phone or in your Bibles, you can. It's John chapter 19. 
and we're moving through from verse 17 to 30. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place of the skull, in Hebrew named Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek so that many people could read it. Then the leading priests objected and said to Pilate, change it from the King of the Jews to he said, I am the King of the Jews. That'd be pretty insulting, hey? Pilate replied, no, what I've written, I've written. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless woven, one in one piece from top to the bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that they said, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. Now listen to this part. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, dear woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. And many scholars would say that that was John. So here's Jesus' mother. She's watched her son be tortured and nailed to a cross. She's watched the crowd mock him and then gamble for his robe. How would you feel as a mum watching that happen to your son? And yet here's Jesus dying on the cross for the salvation of humanity, holding the world together, about to pass from death to life eternally. And what is his thought? His thought is, my mum needs a son and my best friend needs a mother. His dying thought is relationships. His dying thought is what's going to happen to my mother. My best friend needs a mother figure. They need family. Are we at Cadenia family? I would hope so. I, I would hope this is a place where we can do messy stuff together. It's certainly how I've found it to be. It's powerful. But you know, isn't it just the fulfillment of the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. It's always been about relationships. And you know, we talk about strong water. We talk about glue. We talk about that mother figure. Well, you know what? Sometimes God calls us to carry one another's burdens. Sometimes he calls us to be a mother by being strong water or glue for another person. So in that way, even as men and children and childless women, we are called to be like a mother. Does that make sense? It's important. First Timothy chapter five, verse two says, treat older women as you would your mother and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. Isn't that awesome that we've got that in our community, that we can have that? But you know what? Maybe there are some people sitting here right now, some mums or some dads or some kids who are maybe too broken or have had so much trust broken with human beings 
that they don't feel that they can do that, that they can rely on a human being to be a bit of glue for them. You know, I've been in that space too. It's a, it's a tough, tough space. Well, the interesting thing is that the Bible speaks repeatedly of God, the Father, as a mother. Now, the Bible never says that God's a woman, but he does, the Bible does compare God with the compassion of a mother. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13, he says, As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. So because we are both as male and female, created in the image of God, it, it really shouldn't come to any surprise, should it? That, we ha- that God has some, some compassionate motherly traits. Another verse likens God's motherly compassion to us like a hen brooding over her chicks. Have you ever seen a broody chicken over her eggs, over her, tri- her chicks? There's another verse in the Bible that alludes to God's motherly traits. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God messengers. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. Do we ever not let God love us and care for us the way he desires to care for us? Um, You know, a few years back, we had some chalks. Mark hated it. I loved it. I loved waking up to a rooster and a big fat cockadoodle do. (laughs) Wasn't Mark's favourite. He was like, let the sun wake me up with streams of rays through the curtains, not a rooster. But we had fun with these chalks. So we had um, Henry and Henrietta like play school. We had Bucket, Bucket of Chicken. Red Rooster, KFC, oh, like just a whole bunch. And then we had these little chicks that we'd raised. Um, one was Fluffy and Black, and so one of the kids had the most creative name ever and called it Black Fluff. And then we had Charming, like Prince Charming. So Charming had been walking around the chicken coop and we had chicken wire and he'd actually cut himself on the wire and like his gizzards were hanging out like it wasn't good. And I rang around the vets, none of them could be bothered helping him and I was just like, get me the super glue. He grew to be like a full on rooster, right? But we had this other hen who as the babies were, the baby chicks were hatching, she would peck them to death. And so we had to, I had to sort of sit by and just as the chicks hatched, just grab them and bring them to safety. We had to hand raise about eight chicks. There was another hen that was completely the opposite. She was just broody and she's spreading her wings out and she's just loving the mother thing. It was just a natural thing for her. And it got me thinking about that Bible verse. I'm thinking, I wonder if she would take in these other chicks. And so, you know, I did a Google and they said, oh, look, it's a bit hit and miss. I had this play pen that was lined out with more wire where the the good chicken was and so I gathered all the chicks one day and I sat myself down and just one by one I just sort of siphoned them in through the chicken wire and do you know what she did she didn't peck them to death she just spread her wings wider and took in 18 chicks as her own And that's what God's love is like with us. When we feel like we don't belong, that we're not good enough, that we're not doing it right, he just spreads his wings and we can find his love in the shadow of those wings. Isn't that awesome? He holds his children close and he holds them tight. Isaiah chapter 49 verses 15 and 16 says, Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she's born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And that was a prophetic word right there because that's Isaiah. That's long before Jesus, about 600 years before Jesus. When he nailed himself to the cross, well, when he was nailed to the cross. Oh, I guess he did nail himself to the cross because he allowed it. (laughs) 
that scar that will be still there in heaven has got your name on it. He holds all things together, just like my baby rooster with the super glue and Henrietta, because glue is intimate and God is the true glue. He existed before anything else and he holds all things together. Are you still struggling to come to Jesus and let him hold you together? How many of you have seen Louis Giglio talk about something called laminin? Have you ever seen that? It's awesome. If you haven't seen it, Google it. Um, laminin is really important. It's an essential glue that, it's, sorry, it's an essential protein that basically glues cells together and holds them in place. It's like the foundation of connective tissue. Look what it looks like. The cross that was the pinnacle of history that held everything together. Where Jesus told us how important relationships were and how we needed to be glue for one another is paralleled in our human bodies, in his creation. Isn't that incredible? It's just amazing. And so I just want to encourage you today as a mum and as a spiritual mother of the glue holding each other up, that he's the lion. He's the lion that protects you. He's the lion that will devour your enemies. He's like the mama bear who won't let you near his cubs. He's like the mother hen protecting you. He's the gentle lamb that sacrificed himself for you on a cross that gave everything he had to make sure that you knew you were loved. There's nothing more that he could have done for you. He's like the healing coo, giving himself up and being the glue, giving his life for you. Do you get it? Do you get that Jesus is the strong water, that Jesus is the glue? So no matter where you feel like you're at right now, no matter where you've been, where you feel like you're going or not going, how close you are with your own mum and your own kids, that God's got you, that he's holding you together. that you are strong water. God doesn't call us based on our past or limit us. God calls us into our destiny and our future and he's calling you to strong water, to glue, to the breaking of generational damage that has bound your family for years. And now we say enough. We say by the name of Jesus, we break every chain, every generational damage, every addiction, every fear, every bad parenting, every broken heart. And we cast it into the abyss in the name of Jesus, covered by the blood of the lamb and held together now in a bright near future. A future of faith and hope and love and resurrection and light. Do you receive that? Do you receive the love of Jesus right now? We hear of God drawing water. He's drawing you to Him. He's the living water. God is love himself. He is safe. He is loving. He is kind. He will never leave you or forsake you. The question is, are you willing? Amen.